I'm so impressed by it, by what members do. And they do it with love and affection and uh, for charity and for fun and for fellowship and whatnot, all that. And most of them, you know, wear, some people wear stormtrooper costumes, fine, but other people are a little more inventive and uh, creative and wear things that are even more uncomfortable than a stormtrooper costume. And remember back in the day, those guys in episode four were in agony because the plastic edges was cutting into all parts of their body and pinching them. And I would find them sticking bits of cotton wool around the edges to, uh, to not squish certain sensitive parts and so on. Maybe in the book, I don't know. But uh, one of um, far more in, uncomfortable costume than the Stormtrooper is of course C-3PO. And I say in the book, there are some people who even build that costume and wear it for fun. And do I gather that surprise guest today? Exactly, that's exactly what Pedge does. And I think this would be a, a good opportunity um, to hand over to Pedge, because I know he's got some fascinating questions that he's run past Anthony. <laughs> hopefully okay. you'll find one or two of them original that you may not have done very often. I'm sure it, it, It's okay, you know, people, I say in the book, because I've written the book, uh, you know, only people would ask me a question I've never been asked before. But if they have, if for them it's the first time, it's the first time for them. The fact that's, that that's a good way of looking at it. What do you think? Is it hot in the costume? Of course it's hot in the costume. Paige, is it hot in the costume? <laughs> it's very hot in the costume, yeah. And there's a bit in your book where you were on about uh, certain parts of sweat that trickle down your body into certain areas that wouldn't normally you know, you wouldn't normally sweat. Uh, that, oh, indeed, normally talk about in a book. Exactly, yeah, and, and I, I could so relate to all the, the pain that you were going through, because I tried to make the costume as close as to the original uh, New Hope version. Um, so when she was talking about the cuts and all that kind of thing, I thought, oh my God, this, this is just so, like, and I'm not a massive book reader, but I'm, I was so absorbed into this book, uh, just purely on the fact that, you know, I could relate to what you've been through. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. Before, before you ask me a question, I've got a very, very basic question. Why, out of all the characters that you could have chosen to build or make out of any kind of material, why did you choose C-3PO? You see that picture behind me? When I first watched Star Wars in 1977, um, that, that image burnt into my brain of the two droids walking down on that sand dune and I was just like oh my god and I was just transfixed of those two droids for the rest of my life really and then it wasn't until um, I was working and I could afford to do these kind of things that I took it a step further and Chris Bartlett who you uh, will know um, he, he, he was uh, good enough to sort of Get, get involved with getting the suit and uh, I eventually built it. And like you're saying about the mid-drift, I had to make things fit me a little bit better because uh, as you get older, that mid-drift is harder to get rid of. Um, so yeah, um, it, it's for me, I, I mean, when you wear that suit, it's about how people just, what you've, what you've made that character. It, uh, it just, I don't really need to, I just get in the suit and I try and be as much as, to your persona as, as best as I can. Um, but it, what you did is just that the suit takes over. Do you know what I mean? And the people just love 3PO. And, and I do. Uh, it's just a joy. And it keeps me going. I, I mean, I'm always, I've been trooping in for about eight years now, and I'm still, to this day, making those fine adjustments, you know? So. As uh, we do on the films, you know, finally on uh, The Rise of Skywalker, I actually had, and I do talk endlessly about 3PO's hands, I finally had hands which were jointed like my fingers, so I could actually pick things up, like the dagger. Absolutely no problem when, uh, uh, I forget who gave it to me, was it Poe? Uh, I don't, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's writing on here. Uh, with total confidence, before it would have been kind of either slapping it or kind of, with very stiff plastic. So having jointed fingers was a joy. And it just makes you feel, I was going to say normal, but I don't know what normal is for a robot. But what was it about that picture behind you that um, was out in Tunisia? And you talk about being hot. I was very cold that day. And I talk about that specific scene and how 
R2D2's club, there were two R2s. Uh, there was one over to uh, the right of picture and then this one, which I was about to kick, because moving that R2 unit in the sand was impossible. It dug in, it got uh, filled up, the wheels wouldn't run. And I talk about when I kick that unit, <laughs> the frustration was real, you know. Okay. <laughs> Well, well, what is the most difficult? Okay, so tell me about how long did it take you to make the costume? Um, all in about eighteen months, or that, that's from because uh, when I ordered the costume, it took uh, nearly a year to actually get it um, because I believe uh, it's made in the Philippines or was made in the Philippines, and then it shipped out to buyers around the world. Um, so by the time I'd shelled out my pennies, uh, and by the time it arrived. Um, I was in awe of it and I put the legs on, they fitted. I put the arms on, they fitted. I was like, yes, put the torso on, no chance. Um, so I had to um, cut and shut him a little bit. And, uh, you know, uh, just to, just, I mean, I had to lose weight. I lost two and a half stone as well to get in the suit. So it's always been a motivation for me to keep the weight off. Um, I try and, I mean, I'm not going to ask your weight, but I mean, I normally stick around the 11 stone mark uh, to 11. Ah, oh, that is... If I may say, that is probably, and uh, for people not in England, there are 14 pounds in a stone. Right. I know, I know. it's impossible. Yes. Um, if I say that I'm about uh, n nine stone something, and I did, <clears throat> we went out to a barbecue yesterday, so, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I weigh myself every day, so I'm about um, 20 pounds, lighter than you on a good day. Okay. okay. But you still look good. But as you know, you are the only one who suffers in that costume if, yeah, if, if it, you've been going it is, it is, um, I, I, I did actually, um, I've got a photographer and we always like to try and do uh, a few photographs of that capture some of the films. We did some indoor, well, we're stuck in a wood somewhere and we did some little pictures and stuff. Uh, and we did a place up on Filey Beach. Um, and the beach goes on for miles and it's just like, uh, sorry, not Filey Beach, it's another, I forget the name of the beach now, but it's, it's, it goes on for miles. It's near Scarborough up that way. Um, and it's like the desert. And it was a hot, hot, sunny day. Everybody that was there got sunstroke apart from myself in 3PO. Um, it just reflected the light off me. Yes. Uh, but the only thing I did get, and I can sympathize you, with you on this one, is uh, I turned around in the direction of the wind and I got sandblasted with sand in my eyes, which was not pleasant. And you can't no, touch like you. Yeah, not good. <laughs> well, so a way around that, um, which we've used occasionally, and especially in, in a scene if there are pyrotechnics, fireworks, squibs, um, <clears throat> the safety crew were very keen to put uh, gels on the inside of okay. the eyes so nothing could, could go through. The only problem with that is um, with the eyes ungelled, it allows air to get in and, and be part of the circulation system. Mm. But boy, do I know about getting uh, stuff in your eye or needing to blow your nose. It's like, ooh, it's not very nice. Did you find that the, uh, the lights of the eyes used to reflect back off the grills? Because, I, I mean, I use the, these uh, are all, everything on him is greeblies and everything are all brass. So the, the light actually reflects back. So I ended up having to take the grills out and paint them black, matte black on the inside to, to stop the light from reflecting. Certainly in um, The Rise of Skywalker, when we were in Kajimi, in those very difficult streets with steps, with slopes, with cobbles, all stunningly manufactured out of nothing, a plaster and woodwork and scaffolding, whatever. It was so real. But then they added uh, water and snow, so the surface became like being in a car wash by the end of it. Um, and the light bounced not only off the grills, but also off the floor and was ricocheting. Right. And it was genuinely, I was genuinely scared and very tentative about, because we were running, um, because uh, Kylo Ren, et cetera, um, was looking for us, whatever. But they said at night with uh, stage lighting and then reflecting and bouncing, and that was genuinely scary. And a couple of times I was really having to feel a wall to make sure I was not gonna crash to the floor, because crashing, have you ever 
ever fallen over. You know what? I've got a couple of questions which you've pretty much answered already. Um, but no, I haven't fell over. I've uh, very ginger. My, my feet and my elbows become my new senses and, uh, and what little vision I've got. But yeah, uh, I, I absolutely dread the idea of falling. And one of the questions was actually going to be, um, did you really get, well, obviously you're going to hurt yourself falling over. Um, what, what did you hurt? Because I mean, obviously the suit, my suit, I think if it fell over, it would take some uh, punishment for sure. Um, but I would imagine around here, the pain, oh, just can't, I can't. I wouldn't even like to think what it's like, to be honest. And you it fell just, um I suppose the real thing is the fear uh, when you can feel yourself going and there is nothing you can do. Yeah. Um, you slightly have to relax and you know you're going to get pinched, maybe cut, certainly bruised. You mm. know, looking at yourself yeah. in the bathroom mirror that night, not a, well, it's never a pretty sight, but you know, even, even worse. Um, and I'm thinking of the times I fall over, and it was the most spectacular one. When I wasn't actually in the costume, I was holding the the puppet in episode uh, two. I was wearing the puppet in that martyr in that cave, and I'm going to leave it to other people to read what happened. Um, fortunately, Don Bees was there, as I had a major accident. But the first time I ever fell over was actually. Um, just before, I think, that scene that's behind you, and it's when 3PO um, is walking near the bones of what was a crate dragon, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the sand, I was walking, and the sand just gave way under my foot. Uh, it was a very fine sand. And that was scary, and I automatically just put my hand out at right angles and sort of stayed in this funny shape. But I did uh, fall over, and it's on... on um, YouTube, you can see me falling over in episode three on the set because the documentary camera was running. And although Don Bees was, he was operating R2 at the time, right there, but there's nothing he could do about me, walking into, for me, invisible polyboard, sheets of black uh, polystyrene, aimed at me going up to the camera lens, just to cut out some of the blue screen, uh, green screen, it was it. Um, they thought black would be better, but they didn't tell me and I couldn't see it, and I walked straight into it. Yeah. And yeah. there, in fact, the polystyrene protected me, but the shock factor of thinking in half a second, a tenth of a second, I'm going to be hurting. I even fell over running towards the, um, what do we call them? Uh, where you meet Billy D. Williams in the last movie, the um, Treadable. That was out oh, of yeah. the desert in, uh, in Jordan. And I fell over a guy wheel from one of the tents that was set dressing because unless you walk around like that, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, you're yeah, going to trip over something. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like I say, my feet, because uh, I still favour at the moment anyway, um, the the old like karate shoe with the with the with the shoe over the top, purely because uh, I can feel the floor and all the you know imperfections on the floor. So. Yes. Uh, in the uh, cantina scene, and again I talk about it, um, if that's the, the step of going down, then I would put the middle of my foot and feel, yeah, and then try and, it's not good. The other thing is to really rehearse looking at the floor, having the crew sweep it, move a rock, move a twig. I mean, it sounds precious, but without that, you are going to, because the smallest thing, if you're going, up, if you're walking like a dead man, it's okay because mm. you're not going to fall. But if you're kind of hurrying, yeah, to chase a being chased by Ewoks or stormtroopers, whatever, you are going full tilt, and you have a, a an extra body weight and momentum and and uh, potential energy you're building up. Um, if you go, you don't you don't have second chance. Yeah, no, you're up. How about? Right. Um, Picking things up, meet, shaking hands. Um, yes, again, I've I've got well, I've just made a set of um, flexible hands, uh, printed ones, uh, and that, I think they're sort of more like the ESB ones that you wore. So they're quite, they're not, they haven't got a great deal of movement. Uh, but the ones that I currently use are pretty much like used, I think, with the glove and the individual fingers. Um, so I I do tend to have uh, some movement in those. 
uh, and I can carry certain things, but like a book, you can't feel the book, but you know, it's there kind of thing. Uh, like when I met you, you gave me the book, you said, have you got it? I said, oh, I think so. Uh, and it turned out to be a fantastic photograph as well, I have to say, but. Uh, but, but you realize that I could say to you, have you got it? Yeah. Because somebody can put something in my hand. I don't know. I just drop it. <laughs> exactly. And it was so good. That day was so good because you, you looked at me in the eyes and, you know, um, I don't know about yourself, but I call them uh, the boob and bum vision because when I'm wearing 3PO, uh, I have to sort of give it that look up to, you know, which kind of works with the character to see somebody eye to eye kind of thing. So uh, when, when, when you met me, uh, the first thing you did, you, it was the two fingers and like, you know, that kind of thing. And it worked really well. Whereas people that are helping me, they don't kind of think of that, you know. So, well, uh, funnily enough, that comes from my scuba diving tra days, I think, where I learned that if you're underwater and I go, you look at me because I'm going to demonstrate something, you know, and, and it just works very well for somebody in a costume. And yeah. 3PO isn't the only crazy costume on a film set. You've got plenty of uh, puppeteers, because that's basically what we're doing. Puppeteers yeah. who do not have yeah. their normal physical attributes. So you have to say, and I'm going to show you over there. Because often you can't hear very well either. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, since the, the, the last helmet that I made, uh, I made it a little bit too thick. And one thing I, I really like to do is to interact with the kids and stuff. Uh, and when I printed the, my first 3D printed helmet, I thought I better make it strong. So I printed it at full thickness and everything else. Couldn't hear a thing. Couldn't hear nothing. So that was straight in the bin. Uh, so this one's uh, quite thin and, uh, you know, it's good. You could also um, drill some minute holes so that you, you could do uh, a little grill there. In the, out, in the, out of sight. Back yeah. here. Yeah. Well, um, I... One of the horrors for me uh, on this last film was that often I would wear a little radio earpiece um, so that I can hear the other actors. Because what people don't realize is when you're wearing a suit like that, that's made of solid material, plastic or metal, each piece knocking or rubbing on the, the rest builds a kind of stethoscope type experience that it comes up into your head. So you are echoing with yeah. all your own body noises. And then you start to speak and talk about building up a cacophony because now your voice is echoing into your yeah. ears. <clears throat> so I would have an earpiece, um, an occasion so I could hear uh, Daisy or Oscar or John <clears throat> quite clearly, but it, several times it would go, because it's radio, into white noise, at which point you feel you are going completely crazy because you have a sound screaming in your ear and nobody yeah. can get to you to take it out. And yeah, you're okay. going, and the, you know, if you were recording my voice, certain expletives going on. Um, but of course it was, it was very helpful. One in one of the retake, uh, reshoots we were doing, which are quite a few, um, they gave me an earpiece in which they would give me the new dialogue, you know, which had arrived 10 minutes before. Mm. Not easy to say anything, let alone new dialogue. So I had Wendy giving me the line as I was speaking. So then I have my voice echoing and her voice echoing and it was crazy it was fine when i was just holding the head up and my ears were out yeah. but when i was in full rig it was a nightmare yeah so I didn't, I didn't. I've, uh, did you i've noticed now that they've changed the neck seal as well where you've got that little bit of a lip uh and yeah. that is because i i'm forever fighting the gap uh, it have some days the little go on and it's superb. The day I met you, I think uh, Lee was uh, helping me because there was a bit of a gap and he was like, keep your head down. It was all like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's just the vein of my, I, I'll be honest with you, Anthony, I think out of all the costume when I built it, that was probably the hardest thing and still is to this day, uh, the vein of my life as it were, <laughs> you know. Uh, See if I can draw it for you. It, okay. it actually is very good at, um, but uh, 
not sure I can do this, but um, but one of the other, it is a thing like that. It's very thin, obviously, a little plate that comes up. Um, yeah. But you have to make sure it can rotate within within that. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the, tell me about the um, the fixings here. Well, okay. Um, the bayonet. Yeah, I've got. Um, I could probably show you on this. Look, this is an old one which you signed for me uh, this when I very first met. I signed anything. <laughs> it's a dead one now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I did, I I fitted, oops, I fitted uh, these clips on here. On the outside. And then they basically just went through uh, through the hole there, like that. So they have a sorry. Uh, so they have a like a lip at the top, and then it just clips on. So it's do you want of, me to? Do you want me to explain what the team did on this one? I'm not please. Yeah, absolutely. See why I didn't. If you if you hold it up, draw that up on, uh, in the picture. Here we are. Um, and I have to remember because what they did was to these are these are practical in this case. Yeah. What they realised is they don't have to be practical because if you take the front of the face and stick those earrings on in in the right place yeah so they're attached to the front of this they then they're just decoration now they are truly agreeable um but behind them if you then so here's the face mm -hmm. here's the thing if you behind them you put a little uh, notch in the front of the face well, and then you bring the back and on the back are two there's a little lug that will go into the notch that right. is what's holding back to the front and then and then this bit holds the two together so literally it is a wow so the earrings are of no use anymore that meant it wasn't a half hour experience to to get the head on all the time exactly. and it meant every shot you take the lid off yeah Phew. wow that's amazing so you can do that for your next uh, iteration I will do, uh, and obviously, like you say, the uh, antenna on the top here is still screwing as as before. Or uh, no, that is still because it is solid meeting solid. Um, it, it's so still a bend clip, I think. So you got like a bend clip, like that kind of thing, and then it sort of hooks in. No, I think there is now a, a more. I honestly can't remember that then. Mm. Do, uh, there's normally the, mm. I think one of two, isn't it? They do the hooky thing, or they do the fish eye thing, where they screw the antenna in. I think the antenna is somehow. Anyway, I've given you the key moment, and you have um, you know, you have you know I, I probably get shot for telling you, but eh, I don't think so. But you work out the rest to make it easy. I will. I think literally it is a sort of half bayonet turn and turn and push. Which is okay because with the neck thing you were trying to get, and every time you push the neck, it all yeah. moved away. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, Any definitely. more questions? Oh yes. Uh, well, what? It, okay. So I had a load. I put on my Facebook page. If you could meet Anthony Daniels, what would you, you know, for the first time? What would be one of your questions? So uh, you'll have to forgive me. I've had to put it on my phone because my printer of all days, as I was saying to uh, Lee earlier, it decided to pack up, so I couldn't print them off, so, but outside of 3PO, uh, who is your hero? Uh, do you have a hero, somebody, uh, an iconic do person that you look up to, or? Gosh, you mean in the world? Yeah, or, or, you know. Or, um, or it's a difficult question, I need, I need notice of that, yeah. That's fine, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure there are. There's yeah. probably my, my wife, Christine, who's the brains <laughs> of all this and the patience. She must be question. at home, Ted. She must be at home in the same room. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she is. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Clever. <laughs> Smart. Cookie Lee. Okay. Um, but but she, she is my, um, as it were, my onboard producer. And... Uh, 
uh, really like my team who look after me on the set, you know, she is also really very much part of the team, uh, organizing a right. lot of stuff, whether it's, um, you know, a cup of tea or a script conference. Um, you, you can't do this stuff on your own. And no. it really struck me when I, I play acted as part of the crew on episode seven, where I was looking after waiters, reds, toppers, droids. Um, a lot of the stuff I had received in the way of being looked after, I was able to really do it the other way around, that I knew what those guys assumed, what they needed, what they wanted, what they would like. And uh, it's stuff I've got that has been given to me over the years. And being 3PO is, is the bottom line, the end of a team, endless teamwork. You know, they are there to make the stuff. You make it happen, but, but they give you everything to do yeah. that and then make it unhappen afterwards. You cannot be 3 PR on your own. No, very much so. Uh, and I get sometimes asked that, uh, can you come down and do this event or blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, it's not just me, it's an entourage of other people to help me. You know, it's, it's not a one man band, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. The, 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 one, of, one of the tricks I realize have, I've realized over the years, that because, particularly in the films, um, 3PO looks a very real character. He's, he's um, on his own two feet most of the time. He uh, speaks, he has energy, he's light, light, light It looks like it's easy. Mm. Film is all about cheating, you know that. So yeah, yeah there is a, a, a team, if only to bring the huge suitcases of stuff, uh, traveling boxes and whatever. 3PO yeah. doesn't arrive in, you know, in a little handbag. No, he doesn't. I have a great big uh, a diver's box of all things, a uh, great big case, and he all fits inside that, you know. Uh, I tried to contain it as much as possible so I wasn't carrying loads of different things. So he's all in there along with his toolbox because there's always a breakage right. of some sort. Um, in fact, on the day that I met you, um, that's a story uh, for another day, but um, there were several times that I'd always wanted to meet you uh, as 3PO. I mean, I'd met you on several occasions for book signing and, and whatever else. Um, but the day that I was in costume, uh, when was it Star Wars Celebrations in London? Uh, I came and met you and that's when you signed this helmet for me. And I, and I said to you, uh, would you mind if I come down and saw you as C-3PO? And of course, lovely as you are, you turned around and said, absolutely, you know, come down. Um, I never got that far. I got dressed up as 3PO, and I was the only 3PO there at the event at the time, apart from your good self. I think Simon Wilkie was there who did a promotional event. Um, but as a cosplayer, I was the only 3PO there. Uh, and I got swamped. I could not get to you. It took me an hour and a half to get to you, by which time you'd actually gone on stage. So unfortunately, we, we missed that moment, you know? Um, <laughs> but, uh, Thankfully, you were kind enough uh, at MCM. Uh, we were there and you came over and saw me. And um, I hadn't got my uh, guy who helped me kit up normally uh, with, in the UKG. Um, and as I kitted up, I, I was being very blase, sort of very relaxed for the day because I was nervous because I knew I was going to meet you and whatever else. Um, and I remember Lee saying, you're on at three. So I'm like, oh, oh okay, brilliant. So at 11 o'clock, I decided to get kitted up. Uh, and I got as far as the neck seal. Oh my God, I haven't got any neck seals. I didn't put them in my box. Why did I not put them in my box? And I thought, I can't do this. I cannot meet Anthony Daniels in my suit with that. Because they were saying, well, we can do something. We can tape some gold. I was like, no, 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 no. So then Lee says, is it a problem? I said, uh, it's, yeah, it is a bit. Um, I'll have to go home and get them. Well, this is Birmingham and I live in Derbyshire. So there's an hour's drive each way. Oh. Yeah. So I think I broke all the land speed records, let's put it that way. By the time I actually got out of the, uh, the bloody place, it was horrendous to get out of. So I was like pegging up, well, shuffling along because of my legs. Um, so I shuffled along, got into the car, zoomed off, uh, drove to Derby. I rang the wife and I said, I'm on my way, neck seals. Just have, and it was a pit stop, it literally was. So I pulled up outside the house, the wife gave me the neck seals. I got back and I had half an hour to spare to get kitted up. And then, and then just to, just to finish it off, the microphone didn't work. So I couldn't speak to you. Um, it turned out uh, these high tech guys, Lee Towsey, <coughs> I mean, 
they were trying to plug them into different areas and obviously i can't show any oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay lee um come back to lee in a minute so, so what happened did did i meet you and you were mute uh, basically yes yeah you came up and you sort of spoke to me um and, and i did say something to you I, I think it was like are you okay and, that, and i was like yeah fine i think i nodded more so than yeah uh, and I was, the first thing I wanted to say to you um, as 3PO was, I am beside myself. You know, I, I just had that, I just had that little vision of, you know, yeah. giving it, I am beside myself, but it oh, never geez. happened because this microphone. Oh. So, but well, I didn't... feel as though it has now, but, but here yeah. you are, it's a sweet story, but Lee, uh, you, you were trying to help. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was about the moment, Anthony, and I think the panic overtook me for, for one occasion. You know, I'm quite used to that on set. We have the occasional panic. But um, on that occasion, I had just this handful of wires and like, I'm sorry, yeah. We can't yeah. let Anthony down here. We've got to be there on time, even if it's been yeah. out of time. So uh, that's what happened. It was. Yeah. Yeah, one it of was. the things I've noticed on the film set is that it's, it's so complicated. People haven't really, uh, fans, don't know what goes on the film set, but I very rarely have seen anybody panic because, all right, you, it's costing thousands of pounds an hour to, for everybody to be there. And if you hold it up, uh, you know, uh, um, but there is no point in panicking. You just work through it. I, I remember my very first shot, and I think it was the first scene in the rise, uh, what was, the, what was episode six called? Episode Force seven. Awakens. Force Awakens. Episode seven, Force Awakens. My first Awakens. scene, pretty much, it was in the medical thing with the guys, and 3PO dressed up, his eyes went out. Right. And probably for about half an hour, Dave Merriweather was fiddling with those tiny little wires. But nobody panicked, everybody, mm. it has to be done, it doesn't help panicking and so on. And maybe that's a paradise of lesson for life. But, yeah. uh, when you met me, no, I was going to say, what was it like? And do you but know when, was... when I will preface that by saying, I used to get, I've done a lot of interviews in the last few years, and you'll be amazed how many interviewers, whether it's about the book or about um, the films, what was it like? <laughs> what, uh, what's, what, what's it like being in Star Wars? <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. It's like something I do. Ask me a question, but I was yeah. going to ask, what's it like to be inside 3BO from your point of view? Um, it's great. It's uh, everything that you've said about the suit, about why would you want to do that suit? Uh, it, in fact, when you signed my lid for the very first time when I first met you, uh, I, you know, you say, what do you do? I said, oh, I do 3PO and, and I do charity work. And you turn around to me that day and says, uh, of all the costumes, um, why, you know, why would you pick that one? I said, because it's a fantastic, iconic costume, mm. uh, a very much love character. And you went, well, it's that very amicable of you. And that was our words. And then after that, I asked you if I could come and see you. Um, but yeah, I think when I, when I, when I do 3PO, uh, when I'm wearing it, I mean, it, it looks very elegant and everything, but when you're in it, it feels like I'm a great big transformer or something. It, yeah. It's yeah, a completely, I mean, diff completely yeah. different, um, point of view, experience, whatever. Yeah. And of course, you have to make it look seamless, pleasant, delightful. You're thrilled to be there. Absolutely. One, one time, um, for, because I asked if I could, I went out in um, <clears throat> Disney World in Florida as uh, Tweedledum or Tweedledee, I can't remember. Huge kind of uh, yeah. round body and a smiley face. And I could see through a gauze screen. I wanted to see what it felt like to be a character not completely locked in. And I just so enjoyed the interaction with the kids who were just like... <sighs> yeah, exactly. You know, not, it wasn't a Star Wars character or anything. It's just a fun character they recognised. And the, the feedback w was joyful. Yeah, uh, the children, like you say, they, they're just in awe of it. Um, uh, and, it, and it's it's effortless really in regards to interacting with people because the magic is there um you know and like you said earlier stormtroopers i mean i've been a stormtrooper i've been a sand trooper and stuff and all that kind of thing um and whilst darth vader as well there's many of them out there doing it they're still very very good 
on the day. People are so excited to see that, but they don't very often see C-3PO. So it was always a massive thing. Um, and to literally walk 20 foot could take an hour. It, it's just ridiculous. Um, I know that feeling. And it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all your fault. Yeah. Lee, I, I want to ask you, because you work on the set, you also work at conventions and things. Um, a couple of times I tried to operate the R2 unit with the yep. things. I found that impossible. Uh, it was like it, it ran away and it, uh, you know, I was worried about crashing it and whatever. Um, you and Don Bees can just like effortlessly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anthony, I put that down to um, years and years of misspent youth racing remote control cars and boats and planes and so on. I, I grew up building all these remote controlled cars and, and other, you know, vehicles. So I think that was a good, little did I know then, you know, it would, it would teach me well for a career that I would start in my 40s, you know, and uh, I think that's possibly why, you know, just, just keeping calm as well. Talking keeping calm, can you, can you describe how you felt when Kathy Kennedy or somebody from production got hold of you and Oliver and said, um, you do this for fun, do you want to work on the movie? Uh, I, I thought it was a bit of a joke at first. And when we went to meet Neil Scannon in the creatures department, you know, and we had, we had a couple of interviews actually, and I didn't know who these people were sitting around the table, you know, but there was Tommy Gawley, Gormley, the first AD. Fabulous guy. Part of the, part of the production team. Um, JJ wasn't there, but there was still some big people there. And I, you know, I, I, wasn't phased by it at all, but I was thinking, what's you know going on? And suddenly they said, you've got the job. I didn't really know I was even there for a job interview. I just think, I thought I was there as an advisor, you know, just to help them along the way. And then we waited about three months before we actually started. So for those three months, I just thought it was a big joke until we got the start date. And um, next thing I know, I'm working at Prima Studios. Wow. And there you, and there you are um, in a fabulously expensive um, production. Um, with this thing that you're controlling like that and you are having to work in parameters whether it's with objects or props or scenery or actors or actors inside weird costumes on a scale of a hundred how terrifying was that yeah just just under a hundred I'd give it a 99 I would say um, I've got to, I've got to say, not just because we're talking now, but one of the people that made it easier for me quite early on was your good self, because um, I'm sure you remember we were at Greenham Common, and it was one of the first times we were shooting driving R2D2 around, and I had to shoot a scene driving R2D2 up the Millennium Falcon ramp, and I was hiding behind a box out of shot with Neil Scanlon, my boss. So I was, I was nervous enough as it was, but then there was Neil Scanlon, my boss, sitting next to me, trying to give encouraging advice in my ear while I'm trying to focus. And um, I was driving R2 up the ramp, and thankfully I nailed it every time. And you kindly seeked me out and came up to me and congratulated me and was like, the years I've worked with R2-D2, and I've never seen him drive like that before, job well done and you, you'd, you'd seek me out you'd mention to a few of my colleagues you know where's, where's the guy controlling R2 yeah because you can't always tell yes yeah. exactly yeah we're, we're pretty good at hide and seek and um, yeah that just that just helps me no end Anthony you know that just calms the nerves and um, fair play to you for, for saying that you know it was good well th thanks, thanks for the memory are you, are you taken on board I don't remember the moment I remember Greenham Common uh, and that underground bunker which uh, yeah. That wasn't at Green Hill Common, that was the interior. No, I'm I'm fine with, yes, I so, yeah. confused. Um, yeah. But one of the things, of course, has happened, which we haven't really talked about, is that back in the day, the original R2 was, was such an innocent, simple creation and back in the day before cell phones. So, you know, we have all moved up the uh, electronic scales here in, in every sense. Um, the original thing made by uh, John Steers, wasn't it? Yeah, in, in, yep. in uh, L Street, That's the, the actual physicality of uh, the remote R2 has improved, increased, has, is a brilliant um, build on what the original was. And the units have become so much more dependable. And I'm always 
amazed at conventions and things where I see whole rows of different colored uh, R2 type units with different names, different genders and so on, to see how mechanically and electronically adroit they are. And you're very much part of that revolution. Yes, absolutely. And thankfully, because of the electronics, like you say, the way they've advanced, you know, and we had Matt Denton and Josh Lee behind us as well, the creator that made BB-8, and um, they helped me with the electronics. So it was partly that that made it easier to control as well. So, you know, there's always a big team behind these things, you know, so uh, credit. All okay. Yeah, a curious thing, of course, is that when I met BB-8 for the first time, who is now obviously a member of the, uh, the Builders Club, um, there was Brian Herring. And this ball um, not only was phenomenal to, to see with him in his green screen clothing and so on, just the mechanics of the arm and the design, the, uh, the logos on the design that gave you the impression it's rolling all over the place, um, the decals, um, but was the fact that in the very first scene with BB-8 that I had, Brian's going beep, 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 beep. And it was like a real revolution. You mean <laughs> this object has personality and character that I can work with on screen. And I've always adored any scene with BB-8 in, um, with Brian there doing the, the verbals. But how crazy that in all that time and only in the rise of Skywalker, did they actually give Brian real words to say. But on set, working with R2, there was never, ever, ever any sound coming out of any kind, whether it's a voice going, you know, I want to go over there, or, um, or, or somebody going beep, beep. But I tried that. It's in the book. George was pretty not good at yeah. being r 2 d um, But to have Brian making a, a, a verbal signal that I could uh, relate to, because up to then, I'd always had to pretend that I was hearing everything. At least with Brian, I was hearing something. And his verbal interpretation of the script was hilarious. Yes. They didn't use it, sadly, they didn't use his voice as the product, which I kind of wanted them to do, but hey, well, I don't, what do I think? Um, so working, but working, going back to working with characters, you know, props, you talk about scenery, you talk about going up the Millennium Falcon ramp. What a nightmare of yeah. a slope for three people. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. Three, oh, going down, I don't know, it's a nightmare. I'll probably <laughs> never do it again, so it's okay. But working with uh, other actors, you worrying they're not quite in the right position that you rehearse. Uh, how difficult was that, scale of 100? Um, yeah, that was pretty intimidating. That, that was pretty scary. Yeah, that, that's, that's up there, that's 100. You know, um, did you ever hurt an actor unintentionally? Um, no, not no. I don't think I did. I must confess, though. I think I must have bumped into bumped into you a couple of times. Um, I'm used to it. Yeah, I know you are, but that doesn't excuse it, Anthony. I I was just felt terrible every time. But uh, <laughs> I was genuinely used to it. The scary thing in episode seven. Yeah. What well, was at one point I was standing next to R2 and I was uh, it wasn't doing maybe I don't know if it was doing the shot whatever but I I moved slightly sideways and nearly fell over a very fine black wire that at that point I think it was a static unit and there was somebody tugging the string just to make him wobble a bit right. and that's scary because I you know don't see the string yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so in, it was much better if you were there. Uh, with sight line being able to control it absolutely yeah absolutely we always try and get line of sight for sure absolutely. i've actually got a video that i need to play to you which is a very quick question from a special guest so i'm just going to share my screen now and uh i've got a little question from hassan the question i have from is what was the most important scene to me between rtd2 and c3po throughout the whole server and um, what makes him and RTD2's bond between them, the duo, so special? How great to see Hassan. I just, uh, just terrific. Um, I met him, of course, in London, but uh, apart from the premiere, the last time I saw him uh, was as R2D2 in the deserts of uh, Jordan, where all the characters were lined up in, in, a, in a row, rather like the end of a, a 
curtain call, a pantomime, whatever. And there was Hassan fitting very easily into the R2 thing. And we're, we're laughing and uh, chatting away. And he, he, he's such a terrific guy. And then um, they put the lid on the top, you put the lid on the top. And um, we did a bit of shooting, which was kind of a bit strange. It was all just looking around and, you know, whatever. This was going to be the end of the movie. And um, then, you know, something happened. There was a long pause. And as I often would, um, I, I just uh, put my hand on top of Artu just to lean on something and to give, and Pedro will know this, to give my sense of a bit of 3D reality. Um, you know, I know my hand is safely on this, my feet are on the floor. I am not going to, I've got three points of contact, I'm not going to fall over. So I put my hand out just like that, bang. And what I didn't know is, you who know, at the meantime had come in, taken off the head of Artu. So I was now banging on top of the son's head. He was very nice about it. <laughs> but curiously, um, one of the favorite scenes that comes to mind between R2 and 3PO is not in the, in the movies at all. It's actually in an episode of Sesame Street where um, I, I went out there to New York for a week or so to do several episodes. And at one point on the street, you know, R2 comes up, beep, 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 beep. you found a new girlfriend. Beep, 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 beep. Um, She's very short, beep, 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 and a little shy, beep, 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 beep. Um, yes, of course, I would like to see her. Um, and of course, we go out into the street, and I look down at the ceiling. Artu, that's a fire hydrant. Oh, it's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> but there were so many, there were so many uh, scenes, and I do like in The Rise of Skywalker, the bit where they had written in the script, um, a final declaration of affection from R2, because in a very British way, 3 people would never say, you know, um, um, I want you to know that you have been a marvelous friend, R2. My best one, in fact. <laughs> and that's the end of it. He's not going to say any more. Uh, or oh, wonderful friend, I can't remember the words. I found that so touching because it was all, that relationship was all unspoken uh, and all the better for that. Um, and that's, yeah, that gave me joy. But her son, it, it was just great to have such a, <laughs> a happy soul uh, willing to be encased in that thing just to, to rock the unit about a bit. I'm sorry that scene never made it, but Hassan made it to that wonderful desert uh, experience for us all. Amazing. It was amazing. Oh, okay. Well, well, just uh, can I say finally uh, yeah. uh, to Anthony, um, when you did your book signing in uh, Manchester at the um, I forget the name. It's not yeah. Centre. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you. I, I know you do it with many other children as well, uh, but when I turned up to have my book signed, um, I brought my little lad along, and he came up and he stood like this, all proud. And he turned around to you. The first things that were mentioned, you sort of said hello to us. And the first thing he turned around and says, hello, I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. And this is my counterpart, R2-D2. And you went, wait. And you turn around and says, can you do R2-D2 beep, beep, beeps? And, you, and he goes, yes. So then you broke out into, hello, hi, I'm C, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then you turn around and said, and looked at him and then he goes, beep, 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 beep. Absolute. Fantastic. You made that kid's day. I mean, and mine. Uh, and it was so good to be that close to hear my idol, uh, you know, to come um, out with a, it's just, it was amazing. It was a fantastic time. Uh, one of the things that happens, I think, if you're in a, a phenomenon like Star Wars, it sometimes, obviously, I now realise, gives you an opportunity to uh, make somebody happy with the simplest of gestures if you will and yeah that's a that's a really nice story but yeah i know some uh, some people aren't always that happy and and one of the things and it's a little difficult to talk about is that quite a number of times i've been contacted in various ways twitter emails personal with people who say that 3po has been a bit of a uh, a support for them because they find life in society a little difficult to uh, 
like to understand, to feel comfortable with. And they find 3PO's over nervousness, his honesty about not feeling quite attached. They found that quite a support uh, and a refreshing element from people who talk about the world totally integrating, you know, having an endlessly good time. And it's something that's only come in the last few years, a feeling that 3PO has a value as a character, more than just being, um, you know, however you think of him on screen, that he has spoken to people who don't feel entirely connected all the time. Mm -hmm. And I feel really, really good about that. And yeah. it's become more uh, vocal in the last few years that we are realizing that not everybody is 100% all of the time, that there are so many of us with, with different kinds of sensitivities. And I know that Lee has, uh, is working with a charity um, to do with, with maybe helping support people. And mm -hmm. I give it my support. And Lee, I think you're having a raffle. We are indeed, Anthony. Yes, the, the charity is called Calm, which is Campaign Against Living Miserably. And uh, we are raising money throughout the day. We're going to have like a Just Giving page set up. And at the end of the day, we're having a raffle um, where we'll be giving away prizes. Indeed. Ha. Huh. Well, you have my full support. And um, maybe later in the day, uh, I can think of something to raffle. Nothing great, but just a little say, I was here, if that's okay. Very kind of you. Thank you. I yeah. would just like to say thank you to Pedge for joining us. But more importantly, yeah. and Anthony, I would just love to say thank you very much for your time. You've been with us for over an hour now, so um, I'm sure you've got other things to do with your day. Um, just thank you so much on behalf of all the droid builders in the world for your time. Yeah. Uh, who are viewing this now i'm sure thank you so much right but then i can say thank you first of all to you for organizing this and then to Pedge, who you know suffers to bring suffers more than any of the other builders i think from what he wears um for bringing 3po into places that 3po would not normally be able to go and you you go and create just as the stormtroopers at a convention or a premier or a party create an amazing piece of theater you are you're here today and I'm thanking you. But then you. also to the R2-D2's builders, um, you continue, you bring the whole thing off the screen and into your realms and into the realms of people who come and visit events and get great joy coming up close and personal. So it's been a bit of a treat today and who knows when we're all gonna meet in person and Pedge is gonna come up to me and go, hello, I am here, um, because those days will come. We don't want them to come too soon because uh, we're not that safe at the moment. And, you know, it occurs to me, a little lecture here, Pedge and I have spent a lot of our lives inside a mask. We have. And it's kept us alive. Mm. So everybody listening, just consider wearing a mask when you go out, protecting yourself and, kind of more importantly, protecting others. So end of message. Meanwhile, thanks to everybody for listening, taking part, joining in, smiling, getting bored, whatever, falling asleep. <laughs> and um, till we meet again, may the force be with you. And with you. And you.